Rub up your engines! Okay, here we have a Matrix. Now, my wife's Matrix, it's a newer one. It's 2010, bought it used two years ago, put about four grand in it, they can run forever. But there are a lot of differences, so we'll start out with the numero uno difference. This is an S, it's got the big engine. It's a 2.4 liter four cylinder engine. But on the plus side, it's not like my grandson's one that burns oil, because this is a 2010, this is a 2007. These are good engines, got good piston rings in it, it doesn't burn any oil. But on the other hand, if you're a cheapskate like me, it gets 24 miles a gallon with this 2010 with a 2.4. It is a four cylinder, but it's a 1.8 liter engine. Rhode Island back to Tennessee, I got 37 miles a gallon. He gets 24 miles a gallon on the highway. There's a big difference in gas mileage in those engines. I love the 1.8s. My Celica's got a 1.8. My old Corolla SR5 had a 1.8. They can run forever and they get phenomenal gas mileage. They got enough horsepower. It's not as zippy as this 2010. And you also have to realize, for truth's sake, he's all wheel drive. All right? As I say, if you don't need it, don't buy it. You're going to get worse gas mods. We got all wheel drive. There's more friction. He's even taking it in kind of muddy, not off road, off road. He likes driving through in the snow, not getting stuck. But he did admit one time, he get in a little too much off roading situation and a little bumper got ripped off. Now there's only a few plastic snaps holding the stupid thing on. I know that. But kind of embarrassing if you're going off road and your bumper's sitting there in the mud, you know? <laughs> and he hasn't any problem in the transmission. Toyota knows what they're doing when they're making these things. And it's got more mileage than my Matrix. We'll go inside. How many miles this baby has? And it's got 179,000 miles on it. And if you look, it also has traction control. Mine doesn't. It's still got the stock. CD player radio in it, no backup camera, and the regular gear shift here, easy to get to, AC, everything still works on it. I'm gonna go through it with a computer to see what kind of shape everything's in, but a typical Toyota Corolla, realize originally they were called Toyota Corolla Matrixes, then they just shortened it to Matrix, and that's made in Cambridge, Ontario, just like my wife's car was made, then they stopped making them. It made a lot of people mad, it made some people happy, because since they couldn't buy another one, they kept their old one, and I got customers, these things have 500,000 miles on them, and they're still running strong. Toyota didn't want to admit they made a mistake, so instead, the other year, they came up with the Toyota Corolla hatchback. They didn't call it the Matrix, but a late model Matrix and the Toyota Corolla hatchback, you can see, they're both Matrixes. <laughs> they just, I guess, decided they didn't want to do it like they do with other ones. Well, we'll make the vents and we'll stop making the vents and then we'll make the, it makes them look bad. So instead they called it Toyota Corolla hatchback. So if I was going to buy another car, I'm too cheap, I'll never buy a new one. I would buy a Toyota Corolla hatchback sometime in the future. If this thing ever wears out, maybe I'll never have to, who knows? But as they say, what's in a name? You know, it still is the same thing as a Matrix. They just didn't want to admit that they screwed up with names again, so. <laughs> and interesting enough, all the ones that I've seen, they were made in Japan. Of course, as I said, this one was made in Cambridge, Ontario. It just says Canada, but it's Cambridge, Ontario. My whole theory on why they stopped making them there is because they still make cars there, but they decided to make Lexuses there where there's more profit. They knew the Canadians knew what they were doing, putting them together, right? They wanted to make more money. I mean, these things were relatively cheap. <laughs> <laughs> the Lexus has cost a lot more money, so it's just strictly a profit motive. They want to sell bigger ones. Now, this one, you can see people have tried. Some of the stuff went bad and they glued it back on. And it looks rusty and stuff because it lives in Massachusetts, the land of rust. But let's look under the car, see what the real story is. Still solid as can be. Toyota learned how to rust proof these things from the get go. Now, I know naysayers are going to say, but Scotty, those Tacomas and Tundras, the frames rusted on it. Realize one thing, this baby doesn't have a frame. It's unibody construction. For some bizarre reason, Toyota screwed up on some of those Tundras and Tacomas, and they didn't coat the frames right, and the frames all rotted. Well, this doesn't have a frame to coat. The unibody was coated perfectly. They use all kinds of anti-rusting paint. It's installed electrostatically on the whole body. It dips in a big vat. Positive electricity one, the paint a different one and it gets in all the nooks and crannies and holes and bonds on. These things really don't rust. And I mean, this is the proof. Now the owner just gave me a good story. It's a warning for everybody else. Rained a bunch the other day. There's water all over. People were getting stuck. Well, he decided to drive through it and it made it through it. But then a bunch of lights came on. 
<laughs> and now when he disconnects the battery and puts it on, they go out for a day or so, and then they come back on again. Well, we're going to put my computer up anyway to see what the heck's going on with it. You don't, even though it's all-wheel drive, you can see it's a relatively low vehicle. You don't want to go through deep water. The car will make it, but then you can mess up the electronics, and you always have to consider. And you can see here, they weren't stupid. The air intake is right here on the top. Now, in the old Celicas, the air intake was down here. That's how I got the original Celica for my son that he destroyed driving to Boston when he was going to college. <laughs> the woman's daughter drove it, and she drove over an open manhole cover. The water was spewing out. It sucked water, and then it blew the engine up. So, always figure out where your air intake is. But you still don't want to drive through all that much water because there's a lot of electronics. So, let's get out my machine and see what it says. So, we got it hooked it up. Seat back a little here. Do an automatic scan. And here we go. Now, normally Toyotas don't have all these codes, so I'm assuming water intrusion has something to do with it. So let's read them. We'll start with the ones that probably don't mean much. The airbag system, indicator of auto pattern seat airbag, active mode. <laughs> now, yeah, the airbag recall I brought it in, they fixed They probably didn't reset the code, so we'll just go back. We'll clear the code. Let's go backwards and see what this code is. Tire pressure monitoring system. Well, we really don't care about that. He's got a power pressure gauge, but we'll see what the codes are. The transmitter, you can't get data from the main transmitter. And the transmitter number two. Who cares? Car works perfectly fine. So, use tire pressure gauges. Interesting enough, my old 7 Matrix doesn't have a TPMS system. Wasn't built with one. And I like it. I like tire pressure gauges. One of these systems breaks down when it gets old. Cost a fortune. Take tires apart. Put in new tire sensors. And then have it reprogrammed. And you're still trusting an old computer system. Tire gauge is a lot easier to use. Now we'll go back to the next one. Four-wheel drive system. We'll see what that code is. Malfunction of engine control system. That could have happened when he went off-road. Who knows? We're going to reset that one, too. He doesn't have any problem with it working. The ABS system, that probably has to do with the sensors, too. Same code as the other one. The cruise control has five codes. We'll see what they are. Interesting enough, one is the EVAP emission leak detection pump is stuck in the off mode, and the other is stuck in the on position. I guess he can't make his mind out whether it's stuck in the off or on position, so we'll reset it and see what happens after we drive it. Now, normally you won't see it in a Toyota anyways, especially that the EVAP pump is stuck on and it's also stuck off. So I'm going through that water. Probably did something under there to the EVAP system. There could be some water intrusion in there. Now, the only one we really care about is this, and that's the main control. And that's got 15 trouble codes, so let's see what they are. But lo and behold, now there aren't any. And I didn't even reset it. As soon as I went to check it, they disappeared. So I'm assuming they're really ghost codes since I went to check them. And then it says, there's no codes here. And then I go back to the main data. And the thing that was red, it said 15 codes, is now green. It says no codes. So talk about a real ghost code. We're chasing ghosts there. So let's see what the reality is. We'll start her up. And we'll look at live data. As you can see, there's a lot of live data. There's 198 points of live data. That's a lot of data. The color coded. We'll start looking at ones that mean something. All right, the math sensor's good. Battery's good. Now, both the short-term and the long-term fuel, it's running a little bit lean. It's adding a little bit of fuel. Now, with this high mileage, there's no surprise that probably the fuel injectors are somewhat dirty. So I'd say get them clean, put some good cleaner in, try that. It runs good enough. But it's not getting the problem that a lot of these get, which is vacuum leaks are typical on these. This doesn't have any I can feel. There's no shaking or anything. But a lot of these will get vacuum leaks. This particular one doesn't have it. And as we're sitting here idling, it's starting to go down. The short term is starting to go down a little. They'll often do that. They run a little bit off until they warm up. But Cleaning the fuel injectors would help. You can see here, it's pretty close to perfection. The target air fuel ratio is 0.992, and it's 0.99296. It's really close, so it's pretty efficient still. Even though it's got 179,000 miles on it. As you can see, the battery voltage is fine. Battery's fine. Alternator's charging fine. See here, it's got zero misfires. These things rarely misfire. And if they ever do misfire, a lot of times the ignition coils just go out. So if you get a misfire on cylinder number one, just move the coil from number one to four, four to one. The misfire goes to four, just buy another ignition coil. This one's still working fine. It can last a long time, but that's a real easy way to fix them. Let's take it for a spin. Now their hoods always sound tinny, so be forewarned. Yes, they all sound tinny. <laughs> no backup camera. We gotta look back. Good thing we're looking back. There's a truck there. And since this has a rather low front snout, 
we're gonna go pretty slow over the bump or it'll drag and we might rip the bumper off <laughs> no when you hit the bumps you're gonna feel it they have short wheelbases like any of them. like the cx30 mazda i tried out the other day they're all gonna be relatively rough riding I did a Subaru cross track two days ago, and it was the same. You're always going to get a bouncy ride on these things. They're just, the wheelbase is too small. And they're made, this particular one is the sporty one, so they're made to be a little bit sportier handling, and they handle quite well. They just are rough riding when you get on a rough road. So we'll get to our little intersection here where there's always the unending traffic jam. Okay, here we go. And I do have to say, the 2.4 liter engine has a lot more acceleration than my wife's matrix does. Yes, it's definitely got more oomph. There's no arguing that. This is all wheel drive too, so you get a little more drag and you generally lose a little bit of acceleration, but you don't feel in this. It's zippy. And just like my wife's matrix, hey, they're fun to drive. They corner really well. They don't over or under steer. And being all wheel drive, you don't have to worry about the rain and the snow in this thing. It hugs the road quite well. But as this owner found out, he went through the water, but then he's got lights on now because he probably got a bunch of the electronics wet underneath. They're not made for going through deep water. They're relatively low to the ground. So you don't want to be going through deep water or you're going to probably have deep electrical problems as time goes on. He just had that happen. Maybe it'll dry out. It runs perfectly fine. It's got a smooth idle, not particularly shaking or anything. And since it's all wheel drive, we'll step on the gas. It doesn't skip and slide like my wife's matrix that's only front wheel drive. You do get a lot more control, I'll give it that, but I'm a cheapskate. And I'd rather get 37 miles a gallon on a highway instead of 24. That's just me, I'm a cheapskate. $4,000 matrix a couple years ago, still runs really well. He shouldn't have gone through that deep water, but it still runs perfectly fine. I do have to say, it certainly has to do with the water that it said it had all those codes for the electronic control system. When I went to test it, it all disappeared. And then it said no codes and went from red to green with me just trying to check them, not even erase them. So <laughs> let it dry out for a while. That's what I say, as long as it runs. I have never ever seen that on a matrix myself. But I haven't worked on any that went through flood water either. That's why you stay away from flood water. Electricity, water, and cars really don't go together. Now you know what you get with an S and all wheel drive. If you're a cheapskate like me, you'll go for the 1.8 instead of the 2.4 and get a lot better gas mileage on a highway. Not quite as fast. Also consider you buy something like this and you spend four grand and it lasts you years and years. You can't really complain about gas mileage one way or the other. If I was looking for a car and I needed one and I found this, I wouldn't poo poo it for that kind of money. I'd buy it anyways and drive it around. Yeah, if you're really cheap, you try to find the 1.8 liter engine, but these are kind of hard to find in decent condition use because most guys are like me, they buy them and then they drive them forever. I had a guy the other day, he bought it for his wife to get better gas mileage to go from Portsmouth to Boston to work back and forth. And he said, you drive it for four years and then, you know, I don't want it, we'll do something else. Well, that was eight years ago and he's been driving it the last four years and said, oh, well, it runs forever and it gets good gas mileage. What do I care? He missed his old Toyota Supra with a turbo, but hey, he's got kids now, he's growing up. So it's a shame that they don't make it anymore. But like I said, really the Toyota Corolla hatchback is a matrix in disguise anyways. I know this is gonna last. And if they last four or 500 and it's only got 100,000 on it, it's gonna last a long time. I can't say that about the new technology because it hasn't been out long enough to see if it's gonna last or if it's not gonna last. So if you never wanna miss another one of my new car repair videos, Remember to ring that bell!